Andy Paul, welcome. Thank you. Uh, the stage is set for mm -hmm. the Halloween special. How are you feeling? Looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to hopefully everybody being really interestingly dressed up yeah. uh, in, we in the be. audience. No, <laughs> we, we look gruesome enough. So yeah, we're definitely scary <laughs> enough. But yeah. Have you ever played a Halloween party before? No, I don't think we have actually. No, no, you wait 45 years and you finally get the, get the big gigs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> finally, result. We're so thrilled to have you here at Virgin Radio. You're absolutely thrilled. It's I want to start here. with um, going to your back catalogue because I revisited your back catalogue over the weekend. And I've got to tell you, it made me quite emotional because it took me back to that point in my life in the 80s where I was discovering my own taste in music. Mm -hmm. But there was something that you managed to do at that time that captured a real sort of zeitgeist of what it was like to grow up in the North at that time. Mm -hmm. How did it feel from the inside? Well, obviously, we were just making our own music. I mean, the, the crazy thing is, is that we actually started as a hobby when we were 15, 16, and our mates didn't like it. So we never assumed we would ever make a career out of it. So it was a big surprise to us when it happened. But, you know, what you said there is, I think the music that becomes the soundtrack of your journey from childhood to adulthood, when you're forming a vision of yourself, just stays with you, doesn't yes. it? That, that is the soundtrack forevermore. Yes. Yeah, and songs are like, they're like sort of time capsules, aren't they? And, and, you know, when, when you hear songs that you haven't heard for a long time, they instantly transport you back to memories and times and feelings that, and emotions that you had mm. surrounding those songs. You know, so that's the power of music, really, isn't it? It is. It's so powerful. I mean, you don't, you, you know, la music is its own language in itself where, you know, you don't need to be able to understand the words to communicate to people. I mean, you must have found that in your careers. I mean, you, you guys have been working together for 45 years? Mm -hmm. more, well, more than that, actually. We, yeah. we, we started about three years before that. So it, it's, I, th I think the thing is that um, any kind of art form, I don't know if sound big-headed calling it an art form, what we it do, but, but it's, you are trying to say something that should be more than you can put into just verbal mm -hmm. which are words, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, th I, think, I think when you do that, it gets into people's hearts and heads and minds more deeply. And so, again, when you hear something, as Paul said, it, it, it draws back memories, feelings, recollections, moments, yeah. people, places, and that, that's what's so powerful about it. Mm -hmm. So, for me, that point in music, it, it, it seemed to be that all of the artists that had something to say, because music was the sort of the big thing, the place where people went, a lot of the creativity went into music. Could you feel that from the inside? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it was a reflection of those times, you know. Music was everything to everybody. There was no internet. There was no DVDs, you know. Video games. TV stopped at midnight, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, music was was your everything. You know, it was it was kind of, you know, it was it was you know how you would dress, the haircut you had, the clothes, your shoes you wore. You know, it defined you as a person then. So. Um, it was tribal, wasn't it? Exactly. That's, it, that's it, the word I was it was, it, tribal, it, was yeah. the, it was the tribe you were in. I mean, these days now, it's kind of this postmodern era where you can mix and match and nothing's really in fashion, so nothing's out of fashion. Yeah. But yeah, it was. And it was, it was linear as well. You know, it this was. is new, that's old. Now that's new, that's old. And it's just totally different now. So you were pioneers of the ele electronic sort of movement, you know, not only in this country, but worldwide. Why and how did you sort of like go towards that sound you know two well, lads from the Wirral we were just looking for an alternative music mm -hmm. I mean you know all of our friends were listening to the sort of the rock music and the, and the pop music of the time and and we were looking for something different and it, it was just pre-punk then we were yes. we so we found sort of alt our alternative movement before punk happened which was German electronic music you know we discovered Neu and wow. Like Raffer, and can, and Raffer, and, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the bottom line was, it was what we were into, and even yeah. our friends weren't into it. So I would take my German import record that I bought on a Saturday morning in Liverpool round to Paul's house because he'd made a stereo. I only had a mono record player. So we developed <laughs> this kind of symbiotic relationship. And we'd listen, and we, we had no money. I had an upside down bass guitar because I'm right handed and mine was lefty. He had nothing. He used to cannibalize his auntie's radios and make noises. And we just started this crazy kind of ambient noise thing when we were 15 and 16. A synth band without a synthesizer, really. <laughs> yes. Love it. And <laughs> you had, I mean, who knew, who knew that, you know, by the time you got to the end of the 70s and the very early 80s, 
that we would have become part of this wave of English synth pop that was going to take over the planet. I mean, it really we certainly did. never knew. I mean, it really, really did. I mean, Architecture and Morality was sort of like one of the seminal albums of that time in that genre, you know, mm -hmm. across the world. And not only in that genre, in music as a whole, because it changed things. I mean, what, you know, where, where did that happen and how did it happen? It just, I think, you know, everything we did from starting writing songs together it was almost like we were building to that moment. You yeah. know, we were, we were developing our skills, deciding what kind of sounds we wanted to use, how to, we were learning how to structure songs. Because, uh, I mean, we, neither of us are musically trained at, at all. You know, I'm and, sure they can tell. <laughs> no, the thing is, we, st we started to learn how to write songs and play instruments at the same time. The very yeah. first song we actually wrote when he finally got some keyboards was Electricity. He was 15 and I was 16. But... Mm. But the thing is, also, we were breaking rules. You know, we, we didn't follow anybody's rules. And we did, we did a kind of garage synth pop album in the first album. Then the second one was mostly kind of like quite dark and gothic. Yeah, I love although that. it had Enola Gay on it, which helped to yeah. sell it. But influenced by Georgia Vision, <laughs> I think. Yeah, and, yes. then, and then the third one, Architecture and Morality. Again, we were a synth band, but we were using choirs and military drums and, and, and things that sounded like bagpipes. And it was just, we, we just didn't follow anybody's rules. We made our own up. I loved the fact that there was a lot of darkness in music at that time. You know, there was a yeah. lot of sort of like goth undertones running through a lot of music, including. This is your Northern music. Heritage coming yeah. out. It again. is, <laughs> it is. It's right. it's well, like, it, you know, in those days it was grim up north. Yeah, well, that's, that's it. And people forget that that time up north it was grim. You know, we lived through the whole sort of, you know, the the sort of like the revolution of the Thatcher movement, and we were sort mm -hmm. of on the outside almost of that. What was it like at that time within Factory Records? Because you were around mm. all of that with all of that yeah. madness it was amazing it was you know, so incredible I, really. I remember my son a few years ago seeing a documentary about factory records and it was showing liverpool and manchester city center he went dad is that just 70s film stock was everything black and dark brown or was it i said no it was just black and dark brown <laughs> yeah. um but i mean obviously it was it was a buzz to us to get signed to factory yeah. i mean we, we did we were going to do one gig at eric's on October the 12th, 1978, just as a dare. So we'd done it, yeah. we'd done our electric thing, now we can get out of our system and go to university. And then Eric's in Liverpool said, oh, we've got a reciprocal relationship with Factory in Manchester. We went to Factory. We met this guy, Tony Wilson, from the telly. We knew him from the news as a Tony news Wilson. presenter. Yeah. You know? yeah, Tony Wilson's amazing. And yeah. we blagged him with a cassette, and the next thing, he, 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 he was like, I want to make a single, you're the future of pop. I love that. I, th I think we used the word beginning with F and said we're experimental, not pop. Yeah, but, not. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to release a record, we'll take it. I heard that it was, um, I heard that it was Tony Wilson's wife. Mm -hmm. it, she was this in is the a car. True story. True story. I mean, and she, we, yes. we thought this was a myth, right? And it was only uh, not many years ago that Lindsay, his, his wife at the time, uh, came backstage to, to, to see us at a festival. And we said, we sat her down and said, listen, you've got to, tell us if this is true. But yeah, she sat down in, in, in the car, in the driver's uh, passenger seat, and there was a black bag full of cassettes that was going to be dumped. Off to the tip. Off to the tip. And she just randomly picked one out and went, well, Kestrel moves in the dark. That sounds interesting. Put it on the, on the, in the cassette player. And uh, she said, I love this. You Tony need hated to sign. it. Tony hated Tony it. Tony yeah. hated it. That. She, had, she persuaded him. And, and then a week later, Tony completely changed his mind, and from being a bunch of hairy guys from Wirral wittering on about electricity, we were the future of pop. So. I love that. It's just but, like, you know, quick. That, that's, that, you, this what, is how it happens. Yeah. That's you know, how you get a record contract. The wife is. takes you out of the bag on the way to the rubbish tip. <laughs> <laughs> it's kismet. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Yeah, so incredible talk luck, to me about Enola Gear. It's been mm -hmm. running through my head all mm -hmm. day, guys. I mean, that is the, the one that sort of... That you was know, our breakthrough It hit. was your massive breakthrough I, I mean, hit. Messages was our first hit in the yeah. UK, but Enola Gay was our breakthrough. It broke us into Europe yes. then, and then obviously in everywhere else. So, it could, um, if we were the other way round, and he was the aeroplane geek and I was the train geek, it could have been the flying Scotsman, da 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 <laughs> But I, I was into the, the aeroplanes. And, I was um, into yeah, the and, and if, if you're interested in Second World War aeroplanes and the morality of warfare, which I was, you come to Enola Gay and it's like, you know, drop an atom bomb on Hiroshima. On Hiroshima. In a plane named after your mother. Nice way to remember that. Yeah. Um, and kill 150,000 people. Yeah. But save five million. Discuss. By ending the yeah. war. So That's what I love about 80s music. You know, it was it was music that was also 
meaningful and it actually did talk about things and I think we've lost a bit of that in today's yeah. music. Well, I think there's an element of that that people have gone very, very safe. Whereas yeah. now, I mean, in those times, you know, it was, we were all kind of anti-rock and roll cliche, you know. So we wanted to bring in subjects that were important to the time or yeah. things we were interested in, but trying to do them in, a, in, a, in, in, in the form of a pop song with a bit of sugar coating on, yeah. but really, you know, with, with a message. It's hard, I mean, it, it's harder now. You couldn't imagine a band called Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, mm. playing weird stuff like we were originally, yeah. getting a record deal. Record companies don't have no. that much fat on the bone and they're not going to spend money on bands they don't think are going to be successful. Yeah. We'd never get a deal now. And also, I, I think most bands wouldn't get a deal now. I mean, I, I always talk about this on my mm -hmm. radio show, Queen. If Queen walked mm -hmm. into, a, you know, into a record company now, they'd be laughed out of Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm -hmm. Be like, yeah. what's that? Get out. Mm -hmm. They I mean, struggled then to get um, a deal. They really did <laughs> struggle then, <laughs> yeah. to be honest. <laughs> but now they would have no chance. So talk to me, the new album, mm -hmm. Bauhaus... Staircase. Bauhaus Staircase. <laughs> now, I was listening to that this morning, and for me, it feels like a real sort of like you two coming back together and owning your space in that world. Would that be a, co a correct way it to... It wasn't a conscious endeavour to do that. Mm. It was just... It was owning, it was owning total boredom during COVID lockdown. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there was nothing else for us to do. But I think, I think we went in and we mined our own style. Yeah. And, and yeah. people said it's more electronic. Um, all, the thing I'm liking about the reviews is all 12 songs are getting picked out. It's yeah. not like there's two bangers and the rest is like, eh. So that, that's, that's exciting. But, you know, and it's, it's the usual, you know, pretentious title, OMD, a tick, you know. <laughs> song about <laughs> politics, kleptocracy, tick. <laughs> song about the future of the human race, Anthropocene, tick, you know. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> this is what we do. But you're still rebels at heart. This is what I love. Would yeah. you say that? I just think, I we, think we are. We yeah. just... When we reformed 17 years ago, I love that. when we reformed, we promised ourselves that we were going to go back to the mentality we had when we were kids. Nobody yeah. tells us what to do. We trust ourselves. And if we do it and nobody likes it, well, we did it by our own rules again, the way we always used to. And that's what we've been sticking to. You know, yeah. we, I mean, we're, we're fortunate now that when we do our own rules, we usually do quite well, actually. When we try to write hits, they usually backfire. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, Pretty much every time we try to write yeah. a hit, yeah. it's, so it's never it, worked. Because the you're hits, working from there, not there. Yeah, it's usually, you know, we'll just write a whole bunch of songs, and it's, it, the best way it is for us is that, you know, at the end of an album, we'll look at it and pick the one with, you know, maybe the catchiest tune or something. Mm. But because we have a, do have this habit of writing catchy tunes on some of our songs, you know, mm. so... So, but we, we can't just sit down and write a, a, a single. We, 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 we start, pretty much every song we do starts as an experiment. And, uh, so, you know, sometimes a really horrible sounding experiment that just gets honed up and honed up and honed up <laughs> till it's pal pal palatable enough to be listened to, you know. You do sound a bit like scientists, <coughs> if you don't mind me saying. You know, sometimes when you hear it, we are a bit geeky. It's, it. But it, it, that's the way we always worked. You yeah. know, we, we, we only get excited when we find something new. Yeah. Um, we always write the words last, so the music has to be exciting on its own. Mm -hmm. And then that will hopefully, you either go, oh, I wanted to write about this, that'll fit on that. Or you just, suddenly you just find yourself singing something. Yeah. But the music always comes first, and we, that's why we hope it's always more interesting than just going, all right, I've written the words, I just need some boring chords now, you know. I love it. I love this. I'm loving this chat with you two. You're Thank fascinating. You. This is so Thank brilliant. I want to, before I leave, I need to talk to you about the phone box. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah? It was this our office. mythical phone box. <laughs> oh, it's very real. <laughs> it's very real. <laughs> but there was a phone box. Talk, tell me the story of the phone box. When we grew up in Mells, which is a little town on the north coast of Wirral, on the other yeah. side of the River Mersey from Liverpool, neither of our family homes had a telephone, which wasn't unusual. No, mine didn't. Not in those days. No. <laughs> um, it's so, one. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So... The, there was a telephone box near the big railway and pub on the main road, equidistant from our houses, where if you ever needed to call somebody, that's where you went. And, or if you needed them to call you, you say, call me at six, I'll be at the telephone. Somebody would go in and get out, I'm waiting for a call. Yeah. That was our office because we had no... So that was the place where we used to phone up the gig guide and say, hi, we're our oh, customer is not coming in. That was the place where we phoned our manager or the record company to find out, you know... I, I remember being in the phone box, phoning up 
finding out that Messages was in the top 20, our first top mm -hmm. 20, and starting to run to his house. And he was already coming over the road. We were like jumping up and down like little kids. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Kind of hit. And then a few years ago, British Telecom decided they didn't need it. The council said, take it away. Like they have with most phone And then yeah. suddenly there was an uproar. I heard and this. And they brought it back. <laughs> and they made sure they got the right one. And it's, it's, it's now... Yeah, it's the right, now, right serial number on it. It's yeah. equally, yeah, yeah. Yep. It's so equally it's the, right the smallest museum in the UK because it's an OMD museum. And it's I love it. it. If you go in and dial, you get to hear me talking about the telephone box. And, and of course, it was the name of our second really? single, Red Frame, White yeah. Light. The second single was called Red Frame, White Light about the telephone. Box. Yeah, with the telephone number in it, and it's still oh, still working. That caused us problems as well, actually, because people were not getting the, the, the 051 telephone. So they were phoning people in Edinburgh and going, there's an OMD there, I've had enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> I literally could sit here and talk to you for hours. Thank you, it's been a great interview. I, I really have enjoyed it. Uh, phone box, has it got your like faces in it as well now? Um, I, th I think yeah, we, we are in there. There's some pictures, pictures things, but, but it's designed and everything. It's mostly like, artwork. It's yeah. mostly artwork, yeah. And you have to phone a number to, to get inside it because it's locked. Yeah, so. Talk to me about that scene. What was it like in Liverpool then? Because we were, there was a lot of music. We were blessed that there was a club down Matthew Street, diagonally across from where the cavern used to be, yeah. called Eric's Club. Yeah. Double basement club, like the cavern, you had to go down two sets of steps. Always fun when it was raining and the tide was high. The toilets used to kind of overflow. Nice, Not nice. nice. It smelled great, honestly. Um, but <laughs> it was the, uh, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. And all yeah. of the kind of weirdos, misfits, outsiders, <gasps> art people, everybody who went to that club and was a member was in a band. And there was Orchestral Moves in the Dark. Also, all had weird, bloody, pretentious names. Yeah. Orchestral Moves in the Dark, Echo in the Bunny Man, Teardrop Explodes, Flock of Seagulls, Dead or Alive, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, this China Crisis. <laughs> all at the same time. It was terrifying playing there on a Thursday night, though, because all of your contemporaries were sort of going, they're rubbish yeah, compared to us. Really? <laughs> so, I love the thing. The thing about blokes and bands, and this is what most people don't know, is there's a lot of bitching goes on about other bands between you. Would you agree with this, I guys? Mean, this is, mm, it, it's about competition. Are we, allowed, <laughs> are, are we allowed to use rude words? Because they, they'd be there like, they <laughs> great gig, well done. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, it. It, it was interesting because there was respect, because yes. we all respect each other, because we knew all these bands. Well, we were all really in the great. same boat. Nobody we're had heard of us, same. and we, 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 we yeah. didn't have a record deal. So that was the one thing that bound us together. Yeah. And then the, the worst part was when people started to get records, just like, they got signed, they're rubbish. How did that work? Why did they get signed and not us? <laughs> I love it. So that's when the bitching started. I love it. But I love in the it. end, they, pretty much everyone got signed. So. Why, why do you think there was so much creativity? Do you think it because it was so dark in the north at that time? Because it was. I'm not lying. It was. It was grim up it's, north, wasn't it? Yeah. It, it's She's different. on a roll here. This is this is the theme to the interview. <laughs> yeah. It was grim up north. We were, like we were posh side. boys from the suburbs, darling. We don't know what you? you're talking about. Yeah, we were working class uh, though. You no, know, I, I, we didn't I, have any money. I think that for a certain type of people, if you were working class, there weren't an awful lot of options that were very exciting. Yeah, right. If you were sort of creative or artistic. And so you kind of found yourself looking for something that's like, you know, I don't want to go and do my dad's job, or yep. I don't want to work in the factory, or I don't want to be a bus driver, or I don't want, you know, but well, am, I go am I going to go, can I afford to go to university? Can I do yeah. that, you know? Mm -hmm. So you, it was just, it was, an, it was an escape from the mundane tedium mm -hmm. and, it was. you know, the, the grimness of it all. I mean, you know, Liverpool, going around the centre of Liverpool in the 70s, there were still great big areas of just, Emptiness, Des desolation. desolation. Well, yeah. they hadn't the rebuilt since the 40s. Yeah. yeah. It was the same in Newcastle. Yeah. We used to play on places. bomb sites when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. There was yeah. no health and safety, remember? No, 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 <laughs> no health and safety. I mean, Liverpool is a much different place now. It's a, it's a really wonderful yeah. city. Yeah, well, Very same as Newcastle. City. They're so. Yeah, and Manchester too. Really metropolitan now. Mm. I mean, a lot has changed in the sort of like the 45 years, mm. 45 years plus that you've been together. Mm -hmm. how, are you, how have you managed to still stay around and still be sort of like, like here doing it? How do, why do you think? You just mean stay around in the music industry? Yes, why? What, what because, has kept you going? Because we still love it, really. Yeah. You know, it's kind of still in our blood. We still think we've got things to say. 
we love playing live. As, I mean, we started playing live. Mm -hmm. We were a, a live band. And we love to tour the world, playing our music to people, that sort of direct interaction. We're fortunate enough that we can play big gigs. A lot of people want to come and see us. Um, and we love to play our songs to people. We're, and, and we're not one of these bands that, you know, we all hate each other and, you know, arrive in separate limos and only see each other on stage. You know, we, we, we're like a family. We travel around. We're, we all get on great. We have a great laugh. You two feel like around. brothers. We kind of are. Yeah, we hate each other as well, just yeah. like brothers. Yeah. We, we, it's a love-hate thing, yeah. No, no, I mean, Paul came to my school when he was seven. We've known yeah. each other since we were seven. So it's... Uh, yeah, we know it's the the, the only thing we argue about is football, because he's a Man United fan. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't easy for him yeah. in Merseyside back Can you imagine in the growing up in Liverpool? And I used to get my ass kicked so many times. Oh, my God, I bet. Are you uh, Liverpool or I'm Everton? a red. Liverpool. Mm. My brother-in-law's Liverpool. Good man. And, but uh, yeah. no, I, I think that, uh, as Paul said, yeah, hopefully it shows that we still have passion and energy for it and that we, you know, we don't go on stage because we just want the money. We don't make a record so that we've got a new logo on the tour T-shirt. We only do it because we want to do it and we think we can still do it with 100% energy. Otherwise, stop. Yeah, I mean, we're fortunate to be in a position where we don't have to do it anymore. We do it because we love it. And you can tell, and that's why it's so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. To interview you. I've really, really Good enjoyed interview. It. Yeah. Thank Re you. Fun interview. Thank you.